Johnson County Museum is opening a new exhibit that highlights a decades old issue that continues to have impacts today. On this episode, hear from those who worked on the exhibit and those who continue to address public health's connection to housing. Whether you live in or just love Johnson County, Kansas, JOCO on the go has everything Johnson County. Here's what's happening and what's coming up in the community you call home. Thanks for joining us for JOCO on the go. I'm your host, Teresa Freed, a Johnson County resident and employee of Johnson County government. Redlining is a term that has historical significance for Johnson County, and by bringing attention to it today, we can see the lasting impacts that cross over into public health. Here to talk more about that, we have with us two Johnson County experts. If you both want to introduce yourself, we'll go ahead and start with Megan. Good morning. My name is Megan Foreman. I'm with the Department of Health and Environment here in Johnson County. Uh, I'm a program manager and have worked with Andrew for a while on um, this issue of housing. Morning. I'm Andrew Gustafson. I'm the Curator of Interpretation at the Johnson County Museum. Um, that's a fancy way of saying I help people access history. And one of the main ways I do that is um, putting together researching and installing and working with our team here to create um, special exhibitions like the one we're going to talk about today. All right, and so we'll just dig right into the, the topic. And Andrew, just tell us a little bit about what the term redlining means and then tell us about the exhibit. Sure, yeah, so um, redlining, is, the technical definition is the systematic disinvestment of some neighborhoods and populations in favor of others, and often um, on the basis of race uh, or skin color. And so systematic disinvestment, that meant that uh, private practices, so uh, real estate industry, banking, insurance, um, we're, we're doing things, and eventually the federal government created a policy around this. Um, and so private individuals and the government um, choosing which populations and neighborhoods to invest in and which to disinvest, to, to not invest in. Um, and so there's, uh, this is a national history. Uh, Kansas City and Johnson County are absolutely part of that. A lot of times people think Johnson County was a redlined area because they think that African Americans weren't welcome there. And so redlined, kept out. But in fact, redlining was about keeping populations in, in the city center. So uh, much of Johnson County would have been a green-lined area um, that was open to white um, investment, uh, populations moving to the new suburbs. And that was all um, uh, supported by the federal government through the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, a program that's still around, looks very different today than it did in the 1930s when it was created. Um, but the federal government, with the help of private industry, created protocols and procedures um, for how to invest and how to encourage home purchases. Um, and that included um, uh, not investing in populations that were black or other minority populations, often in city centers. So that's the background on redlining. The exhibit takes a, a, a huge look. It's a very extensive uh, narrative that the exhibit tells. Um, the exhibit redlined cities, suburbs, and segregation looks at the foundations of this to start with, going back to the Civil War, just after the Civil War in the 1860s, all the way up through the Great Depression, um, how cities were changing, how populations in cities were changing. Um, uh, there was a movement called the Progressive Movement, people um, wanting to order society, create systems and things, and so that was really affecting how our cityscape looked. Um, we look at the Great Depression era then, um, People, uh, their income was um, disappearing, their banks were closing, the economic situation was very bad, and so people weren't purchasing houses. So the federal government and private industry got together to encourage that through the FHA, through other government-sponsored programs, and that's when um, the idea of redlining uh, comes about. We also look at post-war, how that expands um, through the FHA, through the VA, Veterans Administration. Veterans returning from war um, are uh, offered uh, good terms for purchasing homes and getting mortgages and things. Um, and the VA uses the FHA's model of, of not working with black home, home buyers uh, and other minority home buyers. And then we look at efforts uh, in the civil rights era uh, through the civil rights movement to undo this. Um, often failed. They uh, tar Those efforts targeted specific things, but the system that was put in place remained. And so then the final part of the exhibit is looking at modern legacies, things that are still impacting our communities because that system was never um, deconstructed, um, that system that supported redlining. And I know a tremendous amount of work went into creating this exhibit. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know you talked about the research that went into it, but um, just the 
you know, the, the individuals who worked on this and, and the extent of that. And then also, um, if you want to talk a little bit about how this isn't just, you know, some pictures on a wall with some words, it's interactive. Yeah, absolutely. So our um, exhibit creation process is pretty extensive. Uh, we start usually with either a topic or an idea and do research around that. Uh, I researched for about a year on the topic of redlining and its legacies, created an 85 page research paper with footnotes. So I looked at over 150 um, books and dissertations, scholarly articles, um, literally thousands of pages of primary source documents that were in regional and national archives. Um, and uh, we worked together as a team to create a narrative, a, a story for the exhibit, a script, um, and then that uh, gets paired with images. So there's over 120 images. Um, there are 10 display cases with objects um, that help tell this story. Um, and it covers more than 2,000 square feet of wall space, which is a whole new way for me to think about the work that I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a large exhibit and it's a, a comprehensive story. And to help tell that story, to punctuate it, there are large scale visualizations of, of maps that were created, um, uh, lists of communities that were restricted. We have newspaper articles um, written by um, you know, local African-American um, newspapers, the Kansas City Call, for example. Uh, we also have a touchscreen exhibit that, that looks at uh, modern maps, compares them to historical maps, and a video. We um, had interviews with cultural leaders in previously redlined communities to talk about what this looked like on the ground in their communities and what it still looks like. So all of those things, plus a feedback wall. Um, there's an art exhibit. I almost forgot our, about the art exhibit. Um, we worked with the African American Artists Collective in Kansas City to bring art on the topic of redlining um, into this exhibit to um, hear from Black voices, from artists, um, and also to provide another way to process what you're seeing and, and learning in this exhibit. Art has the power to connect us in ways that words sometimes fail. And so um, it's a really refreshing thing to um, go into these art nooks and uh, see these visualizations, these experiences um, in, in different media. It's very neat. And so what is your hope when people come to visit the exhibit? What are, what are you hoping they walk away with? So I hope that they um, learn something new. I think that there's misconceptions around the topic of redlining, and there's also just a, a real lack of knowledge. You know, I, I have a master's in history, and I didn't know most of this history uh, until I started working for this museum. And then certainly I've learned more through creating this exhibit. Um, this isn't something that is necessarily taught in schools or taught to the extent maybe it should be. And so, um, you know, learning something new um, and then thinking about ways to get involved and um, and taking those lessons forward and, and helping uh, a, a large the large community that we live in, you know, uh, not just our neighborhood or our, our neighbors, but the larger um, region or metro that we inhabit um, and how to connect back to that and make meaningful change if we want. And, you know, a big piece of this, of course, is housing. And so housing has implications today in our current environment and that historical context kind of um, continues to today and in, in what we're looking at in terms of housing. So, Megan, can you talk about some of the work the Department of Health and Environment is doing to um, evaluate that? Sure. Um, you know, housing is a social determinant of health. And that's kind of how we talk about it. That's this concept where um, the place where someone lives, learns, works, and plays drives their health outcomes in ways that really the doctor's office or the healthcare system um, can't. So we know that safe, stable, and affordable housing or the lack of um, is a major underpinning of health. And all of this, I mean, it's inextricably tied to history. When whole races of people are denied the ability um, to live in an area where they feel safe, where there's green spaces and sidewalks, where their kids can play um, and build community, when they don't have access maybe to good public schools, um, and, and ultimately then that opportunity to build generational wealth, um, something that where they have assets and they can kind of build um, something that they can pass down to the next generation to maybe use for education or their own home ownership, something like that. Um, we really do see these impacts for generations. Um, I mean, and the topic of this podcast isn't to go into disparities, but, you know, this unequalness between um, races and ethnic groups is visible across a whole host of systems. Um, we see it in healthcare, but it's also, you know, continued in home ownership, educational attainment, um, wages, health, all of those things. So, um, you know, one of the, the big pieces that I think is important to um, highlight right now 
not only do we have this historical context that we're working with, but you know, just in the last 10 years in Johnson County, um, housing costs have exploded. They're up 26% for renters and 22% for homeowners without a mortgage. Um, and another thing that, that this cost explosion has done is really shrink um, in half about the number of houses that are available underneath that kind of $250,000 price bracket. Um, so you really then see that there's not a lot of housing stock for maybe young families or older people who are looking to downsize or you know people who have salaries in line with teachers, police officers, nurses. Um, and there's a lot of communities that are really kind of asking themselves, what do we lose when we price these types of people um, out of our community? So, um, one piece that I'd love the listeners to take away from this is that United Community Services of Johnson County um, worked with the Health Equity Network and a whole bunch of the county participated um, as well as um, several municipalities in Johnson County to do a housing study and then release um, a housing toolkit to really look at cross, uh, cross sector ways that people can get involved in making some differences in this area. Okay, and so can you talk about some of those strategies? Sure. Some of those strategies um, talk about kind of increasing this missing middle, and that's sort of what I was talking about with those homes in that $250,000 price range. But, um, you know, that's going to take maybe changing some zoning laws or changing some planning um, in the cities. But we're talking about duplexes, fourplexes, cottage courts, um, things that are smaller and a little bit more affordable. Um, you know, incentives for builders to build more affordable housing and to help buyers actually get into these places. Um, and then preserving and rehabilitating existing housing stock. And, you know, really taking a hard look at reducing overall household expenditures too for families. So things like childcare, the cost of food or transportation, um, really so that there is a little bit more of a bite that housing can take out of um, that annual income. And I'm sure some people, you know, when they hear that this housing is a public health issue, it, it, there's not a direct connection for a lot of people. So can you talk about if I don't have optimal housing, if I'm not living in a great neighborhood, how does that impact my health? Yeah, it's a little bit two steps down the road. Um, so we kind of have to connect those dots. Um, you know, Let's take, for example, our COVID pandemic right now. Um, we know that our Black and Hispanic residents have gotten infected more, they've been hospitalized more, they've ended up in the ICU more and died um, of COVID at rates that are higher than our white residents. So a lot of this is because maybe they're in jobs that put them at higher risk for infection to begin with. They can't work at home. They're considered that sort of essential workforce that's out on the front lines. Um, you know, there's also a lot of poor health uh, factors just going into an infection. So higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, obesity, other pieces that can kind of impact um, how that disease progression goes. Um, we know even prior to the pandemic data that we collected in 2017 showed that about 17% of our non-white residents didn't see a doctor um, because of cost in the last year compared to only about 8% of our white residents. So, you know, this kind of historical lack of access to a lot of different resources um, really compounds over time in health inequities. And if I, I'm a resident here in Johnson County and say I live in a $300,000 house, have access to, you know, great resources, why should I care about this issue? It's really, if we wanna move forward, I think as a community, um, it's important that all of our residents are doing well. Um, and over time, you know, we see the impacts of these disparities um, and they, they drag everyone down. Um, and I think having that more rich cultural um, heritage around us and just the diversity that it can bring to all of our lives, I think is something that, um, makes communities stronger and makes them more resilient when people know their neighbors, when they can connect um, across some of those things that maybe traditionally have divided us, um, but don't have to. I mean, as Andrew says, it's a lot of this is a historical construction um, that you know we don't have to continue living in. And Andrew, do you wanna talk a little bit about how that transition once this, um, once, once these policies and things were, were taken out you know, how, how did that help improve neighborhoods? You know, um, redlining 
becomes illegal um, in 1968 with um, one of the Civil Rights Acts that's passed in the 1960s. Um, but as I said, the structure that was in place, the system that was built up around this idea of working with some populations and not with others on the basis of race, um, didn't go away. And so while access to the suburbs or communities that weren't in disinvested areas in downtowns, for example, um, opens up, there's new access, uh, you know, segregation ends, and so people have the um, theoretically the ability to move to other neighborhoods. Um, it didn't always happen that way. Um, for one thing, if um, you've been denied for 30 years the ability to purchase a home on a mortgage that provides equity as you're paying your mortgage and your home is um, increasing in, in value while you're living in it and paying that mortgage, if you've been denied that, um, you're that much money behind the populations that have been able to do that, been able to attain that. And so by the time 30 years later, the, the neighborhoods in, say, in Johnson County are available to residents in Kansas City, Missouri, who are living in previously redlined communities, the, the housing costs might be too high to be able to move in there. So while the access is created, the, the ability is not necessarily there. So that's not a great answer, I'm sure, to the question. But um, and that's, as Megan was talking about, that, that still exists, right, on that issue. And to go back to the question you had just asked, Megan, why should people care. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a national history, as I said, this is the history of almost every city and its suburbs across the United States. And it is uh, an integral piece to Johnson County's history um, and Kansas City's. They're, they're connected so strongly in this, in this issue. Um, and so understanding that history, why our communities look the way they do, um, why some people live in some places and others in, in other places, why we feel a way about a certain area or don't feel a certain way about a certain area, that's all coming from this history. And so understanding that I think gives us a better understanding of ourselves, our communities, the people we live around. And um, you know, hopefully we can use that to think about what we want our communities to look like in the future. The next question just is how do people get involved? How do they you know, take that first step of educating themselves about the, the issue? And then what can they do to improve the, the situation here in Johnson County? Yeah, so I mean, uh, obviously, we want you to come see the exhibit. <laughs> uh, so that's one way. Uh, absolutely. We have a website, though, a web page, jcprd.com slash redlined. That's the uh, web page for the exhibit and all of the associated programming. We're offering over the course of 2022, a full slate of programming on various topics, historical connections and modern legacies related to redlining. And so that's a great way um, to uh, learn and learn more, get involved that way. Um, we also have partnered with with institutions, libraries, museums, and other organizations across the metro and the region. Um, they are offering programming at their own institutions and locations in conjunction with our um, efforts here at the exhibit and our programming over the course of the year, more than a dozen institutions. And so um, there are lots of ways to learn, lots of things that you might be really interested in. The Blue River, for example, Blue River Conservancy is a, is a topic that will come up. Um, and uh, environmental uh, racism, environmental justice, uh, healthcare, right? Um, through the panel that uh, Department of Health, uh, United Community Services and Health Forward Foundation will be participating in. Those both are happening in September. So those are two very different ways to learn things that, might, that you're maybe very passionate about. On our website, we have a list of resources for reading more, learning more online and in books. Uh, and then lastly, you know, for me, redlining was uh, about community disinvestment. And so uh, investing in those communities um, in a variety of ways from uh, learning about organizations that do work there, volunteering there, uh, or, you know, thinking about where you go out to eat or where you order food from. Um, that is all uh, a way of, of um trying to uh, work, you know, to, to make a better future. Um, and so one thing I've learned we, that we all have learned on the museum staff going through this process is that listening to the communities historically didn't happen. Um, the communities were excluded from the policies that were being created. Um, those policies were uh, placed on them. And so listen to the communities um, that you want to help and see how they want to be helped and um, what you can do to help them and get involved. Um, that would be um, the last thing for me. Yeah, and Andrew, I'd even pick up on that point. Um, a lot of the work that this housing task force has done um, is really now 
you know, gotten legs and is moving in city councils and other places around the county. So, um, you know, I would encourage people who are interested in getting involved today um, to see what their city is doing to increase affordable housing, um, ask people who are running for office for those local um, seats, and, you know, learn what you can do to help push some of these policies um, and new practices forward in your community. Um, and I would also say, Andrew, I'm so glad you brought up the idea of even environmental justice, because as the Department of Health and Environment. Um, we're also featuring uh, for Black History Month a lot of different leaders um, in some of these spaces that have kind of come down through time. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to just visit us on Facebook at Joko Health Department. Joko Health DPT is the um, is the handle. But um, yeah, I can't I can't echo enough. Um, learning, getting out there. There are so many great resources and books um, that are are easy to kind of meet anybody where they're at. You know, are you just putting your toes in the water on some of these issues? Are there things that you're passionate about and you really want to get out front um, and move some of them forward? I think there's a place for um, anybody in that journey. All right, great information. I think, you know, just the bottom line is no matter where you live in Johnson County, everybody should have an interest in this, this topic. Um, there are things that, that any one of us can do to improve the situation and to learn about how uh, that, that history is impacting us today. So uh, of course we encourage our listeners to visit those websites and get more information and um, hopefully make a trip out to the museum and check out the exhibit. And that exhibit is running all year long. Is that right, Andrew? That's right, it runs through January 7th, 2023. Um, so it'll be there. All right, plenty of time to get there. Thank you both for joining us today. Great information once again, and we appreciate um, all the all the details and also the all the hard work that's gone into the, the the things that you're doing to to bring the issue to light you just heard joko on the go join us next time for more everything johnson county have a topic you want to discuss we want to hear from you follow us on facebook and twitter at joko gov for more on this podcast visit jocogov.org forward slash podcast thanks for listening